a clash of heads. Ooh, look at that. You can see there's a heavy gash. If he was anything but right, he goes down. He'll get up and he'll head off in the wrong direction. And then he'll go down again. And up he gets and goes again. Oh, he looks oh. impressive. Oh! The AFL takes it very seriously, any knock on the head. The head is sacrosanct. Everyone knows that. Everyone who listens to football, watches football, anything, knows that the head is sacrosanct. In truth, the head is not sacrosanct in football, which is why the drive is on to research and quantify the very real and dangerous risks to players. Welcome to Four Corners. A year or so ago, we reported on the growing alarm about the risk of early-onset dementia from head injuries in American football based on research findings. A particular form of dementia and memory loss known as chronic traumatic encephalopathy, or CTE, found in some footballers, is now believed to have been caused by concussion or repeated head injuries. We know that concussion is not uncommon in all contact sports. In Australia, a study commissioned by the AFL Players Association, due for release later this year, has found that of nearly 600 former players surveyed, more than half had had at least one concussion and more than a quarter had suffered three or more concussions. The latest research is even more startling. It suggests that multiple hits to the head, not severe enough to cause concussion, known as sub-concussive hits, may also lead to CTE. One study in the American Journal of Sports Medicine shows that female and younger athletes take longer to recover from concussion than others. The implications in all this research are obvious and could change the face of high-impact sports, from elite professional athletes right down to young kids, regardless of how administrators or spectators might feel. Tonight, we present a Four Corners investigation which questions the resolve of three of the four football codes in Australia to deal with the issue with any urgency. This report from Quentin McDermott. In rugby union, as in rugby league and Australian rules football, bone-crunching hits are an occupational hazard. Getting back into the fray following a heavy knock is the mark of every courageous player. And this is a head clash and they are both out cold before they've hit the ground. In AFL, the hits can be both brutal and unexpected. It's a 360-degree game, and with players challenging for the ball from all directions, there's a greater chance of being hit on the side or back of the head. A player is waiting to take a mark, another player runs from behind. Dr Andrew McIntosh uses computer modelling to demonstrate the effect of hits to the head in AFL. This player is looking to catch the ball. They may not be aware that someone's running in from behind to also get the ball. There are other situations like this where they may get hit. And what we've found is that a blow to the side of the head tends to lead to concussion more easily than impacts to other parts of the head. The impact occurred over here. Dr McIntosh has been able to show what happens to the brain when it's shaken by an impact of this kind. The red is indicating where the greatest strain is and there's red emerging in the middle of the brain and the brain stem. So he's already down. Oh, so Jones is still oh, stagger. Yes. The AFL acknowledges that six or seven concussions occur per club per year, but only one of those concussions results in a game being missed. That really hurt the tough guy. We take the issue of concussion extremely seriously, but the incidence of concussion is not at alarmingly high levels. Clash your heads. That boy has moved. So most players who do suffer a, con a concussion, it's a mild concussion, and they're deemed to have recovered sufficiently to be able to play the next game. When Hawthorne's Jordan Lewis was knocked cold in this sickening collision in 2010, he too was deemed fit to play again the following week. Football is played harder and faster at school and community level. Concern is growing about the number of head knocks sustained. 
I do believe this is a hidden epidemic among you know, non-professional sports participants in contact sport. How serious a head knock is in the long term depends on how well or badly the concussion is managed. The boys from St Edmunds School in Canberra are trained to play rugby hard but safely. If they sustain a concussion, they take time out. Very clearly at St Edmunds, if a player is concussed here, the, the minimum uh, standard for us is three weeks. But not all coaches follow Pat Langtry's example, and not all young players receive such good advice. Over three seasons, from 2005 to 2007, Professor Mark Stevenson led a study of 3,000 amateur rugby players ranging in age from 15 to 48. What he uncovered was alarming. We found that 7% sustained a head injury within 10 playing hours, and that increased to 14% of players by 20 hours of playing. So 20 hours is equivalent to one season. So that's a sizable proportion of players sustaining a head injury. Mark Stevenson discovered that players who'd suffered a head injury the season before were twice as likely to be injured again the next season. Michael Broom, who now plays fourth grade rugby for the Gordon Greybeards, was one of them. In 2004, he suffered a serious concussion after being kicked in the head by an opponent. It was actually a huge hit, the worst concussion I've had, where pretty much I lost all memory and all I could hear on the ground was a bit of noise. Just had no idea where I was. It took a couple of hours for memory to come back. The following season, he was concussed again in a tackle, and his symptoms recorded for Professor Stevenson's study. They included nausea, vomiting, dizziness and fatigue. But none of that held him back. Yeah, on the Tuesday training, straight back into it. Why did you do that? As I, I, I felt good and no one told me not to. The rule in rugby union is that anyone who is concussed is supposed to stay away from the game for at least three weeks unless cleared to return to play by a doctor. This study found that most players didn't receive return to play advice post-concussion. And of those who did, all failed to comply with the three-week stand-down regulation. I mean, that's very worrying, isn't it? Of course it is. You know, we, you know we we, we're, we're taking concussion seriously, so that's why we're in, in our attempts to improve knowledge of how to treat concussion. Um, as, as, a governing, as a worldwide governing body, we have to improve our education. Should these guidelines be enforceable? Of course they should be. We've got to educate first, and then enforce. Pat Langtree believes that this much-needed education is at last filtering down from the Australian Rugby Union to schools and amateur clubs. Yes! The ARU has come on board really well with their smart rugby policy, whereby every two years any coach, any parent, any volunteer must be um, certified, particularly in and around the, the contact coaching of the game, making sure that players of any age are, are kept as safe as possible through, through good practice. But for weekend warriors like Michael Broom, the message hasn't quite hit home. Rugby's about being there for your mates and it's a team sport, so I guess you feel like you're not looking after your mates if you're not on the field, so getting back into it's the, the thing to do. Go, 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 go. Across the football codes, current guidelines stipulate that any player diagnosed as concussed should not return to play the same day. And further rule changes may follow. With every week that passes, there are more head knocks, more concussions, and more players left wondering whether the damage caused will be permanent. And as our children grow up to be bigger, stronger, and faster than their parents, the test will be whether the game can be made safer for them while retaining the raw excitement of a body contact sport. Hopefully the joy without the pain, short and long term. And incidentally, for those who might look to headgear for protection, that might prevent some injury, but it doesn't do much to stop the movement of the brain inside the skull, which is what causes concussion.